Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, we're, we're back again to do some more science learning. Um, preserve them, I say. Take a look at the script given, and I'd like you to give me the topic for today. What's our topic for today? Mangroves. Yes, we're going to be talking about mangroves today. Preserve them, I say. This poem was written by a student of St. Andrew's School. Red, white, black, and buttonwood. Surely mangrove trees are good, having their use along the coast. Homes for birds and other hosts. Don't you dare destroy them now. They have their use, just listen how. From the bark, you get tanning oil. The still prop roots hold together the soil. Elston. You can also use the bark for tea that prevents many disease, can't you see? Why not preserve these trees? They are the home for many different animal species. So why not preserve them and use them in a wise way? They are the reason why soil along most of the coast is held together every day. Just preserve them and see how important they all could be. Kyle. Why not preserve them, my friend? Their precariousness shall shine in the end. From cures for illness to homes for birds, all kinds of fishes, their presence on the shore acts as a, wild, as a windbreak, you know. Their fibrous pulp is used for paper. Surely these trees we have to stand for. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just take a look at, the, at, the, at what the poem relates, right? And then we'll discuss a little of what it says. This poem is relating about mangroves. And of course, the main topic of the poem is mangroves, all right? Where can we usually find mangrove trees? Have you all ever seen mangroves? How many of you have seen mangroves? Right? Thank you. Where can we usually find mangrove trees? Where do we find them? Yes? By swampy areas. Swampy areas. Very good. Anywhere else? Swampy areas. Anywhere else? Elston? Um, usually along the coast. Along the coast. Very good, thank you. What is the main message conveyed to us by the student? What does he convey to us? I guess they had a wonderful mangrove lesson and he was quite inspired by, by what his teacher shared and probably what they researched. What is his message to us? Can I ask Krisha? Yes. We need to protect them. Protect. We need to protect mangroves. Do we agree with that? Do you all agree with that? Okay. We need to protect mangroves. According to the poem, how can mangrove trees be utilized? You want to take a look back? Let's take a look back. How can mangrove trees be utilized? You can use the, the bark of the mangrove to uh, make tea and it also prevents um, diseases that can't, can't detect. Yes, that is true. That's what he says. He says that it can cure illnesses to conserve mangrove. Why do we need to conserve? Why do we need to protect mangrove? Go ahead, Elston. Well, because the mangroves are habitat to a lot of um, rare birds, uh, birds that are in, in extinction, and also, uh, also for the fishes. Yes, because of, of um, providing that habitat. Um, Erwin, would you like to share anything else? Well, we need mangroves to help hold the coast together. Without them, the soil would just erode, and most of the coast along Belize would be gone. Thank you very much. Very good point. Thank you all for your participation. All right, I'd like you to sit back, and we will now 
watch a little video, you need to listen keenly to what is being said here. I'm standing next to Rhizophora um, species. I don't know which species it is here. It's characterized by um, some, some features that are fairly common in plants that are found with their feet in the sea and their, their trunk in the air. Rhizophora mangle has prop roots and stilt roots. These are the stilt roots. These are the prop roots. And they have um, sclerophyllous leaves, so fairly waxy leaves that help them conserve water. Because despite the fact that they've got their feet in the sea, they still have a problem conserving water, fresh water. Now the seeds are interesting. The seeds hang off the tree and they're not really seeds anymore. These are, these, are, these are young plants. So they're growing before they leave the tree. And they have a pointy end, bottom, and then the, the growing end at the top of the acorn. End. And what happens with these is they float in the sea when they first drop, like this. And as they get a little bit older, the top end becomes hydrophobic, and the bottom end becomes hydrophilic. So the whole seed, or the young plant, turns over and bobs around in the sea. And eventually, that young, after a couple of weeks or a couple of days of bobbing around in the sea, that young plant uh, finds lodges somewhere along the coast and the tree starts to grow. This is another species of mangrove, and it's the mangrove that's responsible for producing the pneumatophores that you can see in the sediment around me. One of the problems that mangroves have is that um, they have to get rid of excess salt that they've taken from the water. Things like red mangrove, uh, the earlier species, do this by um, using evapotranspiration, which sucks water through the plant. But species that live slightly higher up on the shore, um, like this one, don't have that option. So there are a few different methods that they use for getting rid of salt from the from the system. One method is to fill old leaves with salt and then they drop the leaves. So that gets rid of the, the salt problem along with tissue that they don't want to have anymore. And some of them have salt glands at the base of the leaf um, on the PTO. And it's still as yet it's unknown how these salt glands work but it's known that they do extrude salt. Another adaptation that's quite common on halophytes, uh, including some mangrove species, quite often they'll have hairy leaves, or the back of the leaf will be hairy. And that means that when salt is extruded from the leaf, it's kept away from the tissue, and that means that the tissue doesn't get burned. Associated with uh, all mangrove species are a variety of uh, animals that live on them, and one of them is the mangrove periwinkle. Now, mangrove periwinkles are only found um, attached to um, mangroves. Surrounding me on the bottom here, and this is sort of soft mangrove sediment, which is really rich in um, organic material, are bits of wood sticking up. And they're called pneumatophores, and they come from mangroves other than the red mangrove that grow slightly higher up in the, um, the tidal cycle. And they, where each root from the tree comes out and spreads out along the bottom, you get these uh, pneumatophores popping up every now and again from that root. Pneumatophores allow the tree to breathe over more of the tidal cycle so they can get oxygen to the roots. The roots themselves are down in really anoxic, really sort of smelly, smelly mud. I don't know if I can get it. This mud is really sort of full of, you can see it's full of vegetable material, so there's no oxygen in there at all. And in order to get past that um, lack of oxygen, these trees have got these hollow pneumatophores running along the roots. Thank you for listening and, and viewing. But what did the essence of what he was saying there, what did you capture from that? Is there anything that you learned from what he was saying? He said that the type of roots that mangroves have are stilt roots. Stilt roots, okay. That was one mention. Okay. Is there another person to share? 
what you learned just now? There are two kind of mangrove, two but, kind mm -hmm. of species, and the the animal that lives on mangroves are periwinkles. Okay, the flower that grows on it is. Um, thank you. Two species of mangroves. Okay, he mentioned two, and later we're going to find out more about the species. But thank you very much for, um, for listen, listening so keenly. Go ahead, Edwin. I noticed that um, the man said um, in the form in which they were produced is uh, in the form of um, spores. Mm -hmm. It would fall off of the, um, the tree and then land in the water. In the water, it would start growing more and find its way we can um, find a better habitat to start growing again. As you said, the spores is going to start to germinate even before it drops off the tree. And then it continues and may other, many other things happen. Elston? Well, one thing he said that the mangrove filter the salt yes. because of the waxy layer of the leaf and how they get the oxygen from the pneumatophores that were in the ground. Yes. Um, well, he said um, the, the leaf have a transparent wax layer on top of it that when the salt water, because sometimes they got high tide and sometimes there's low tide, so when it's high tide and the, the sea covers the leaf, the transparent layer, when it's ready to get um, yeah, sun, or the, the, filters, the, the salt. filters the salt mm -hmm. and only the fresh water goes in. Okay, thank you for sharing. Now, um, I would like to share a few of the terms that came up in this, um, in this video that we saw just now, because understanding these will help us through to understanding exactly what this man um, was teaching us just now. Okay, there's one term here that was mentioned. What's, that? What's the name there? new metaphors and it says it's a specialized root that the branch that the branches penetrate upward and undergoes gases exchange exactly what elston was talking about what did you call it just now metaphors. you knew metaphors but what did you call this just now gases you spoke about the oxygen right the exchange of gases a specialized root that the branches penetrate upward and undergoes gases exchange. Krisha, would you like to relate this in your own words? A little explanation? How do you, how do you understand, or what do you understand about new metaphors, according to its definition here? Specialized root um, is, simply means, uh, it's like the lung of the mangrove. Repeat that again. It is like the lung of the mangrove, which or which leads to its um, respiration or to okay yeah okay for respiratory right thank you and the propagules the propagules can Ashley read about the propagules please take the mic the portion of the plant such as the bud that aid disper dispersal of the species. Did we, thank you Ashley, did we hear this term while um, viewing the video? Did you hear the term? All right, it's the portion of the plant such as the bud that aids dispersal of the species. All right, and we're going to continue to discuss these, okay? The prop roots, another word that was mentioned was prop roots that mangroves, they have prop roots. Um, release, release, can you read what are prop roots, please? Prop roots, the root arises from the stem, penetrates the soil, and helps support the, the stem. And it's also known as the brace, brace root. What do you understand if it's called the brace root? When you, when you think about a brace, what does a brace, what is a brace needed for or used for? A brace is used to keep something in place. To keep something in place, to support. 
A brace is used to keep something in place. And the other word we can use there is to support. So it says that it arises from the stem. It begins there, it penetrates the soil, and it, at the same time, it is supporting the stem. Aerial root, which is a root that develops from a location on a plant above the surface of earth, water, or from a stem. This is also a part of mangroves that we will hear about later. Aerial root. And a word that we heard just now was submerge. Mangroves are submerged in water. We heard about the seedlings. Seedlings are the younger, um, the younger plants. And there's another term here that will come up. is the viviparous. This means producing seeds that germinate detached from the parent plant. It says germinate before, before becoming detached. What would detach mean? If it's detached, go ahead. If it's detached, Edwin, what would detach mean? It will fall off. It will fall off. Extent. Good. So, Paris is actually saying that the, the seed germinates before it falls off. And he explained that, that it starts on the tree and later it falls off and then it starts to handle itself be on its own what are mangroves mangroves are a diverse group of unrelated trees palms shrubs vines and ferns that share a common ability to live in waterlogged saline soils subjected to regular flooding waterlogged saline soils Alexander, what is water log saline soils? What do you understand by that? That's the soils where they can live. They can live or survive. In, survive in saline. saline. If it has if it's if saline it's soils. um related to saline or that means that it is Mangroves. the key word there is. It's salty. salty. And what would waterlog mean? Anyone else? Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? Waterlog. Go ahead, Edwin. It is surrounded by salt, um, by salt water. Um, the soil right there is also um, salt, which um, provides the, the plant with it, its nutrients that it needs to live in. Yes, it's a place that is always, um, that is always um, marsh or swampy, right? Okay? Develop unusual adaptations to the unique environmental conditions in which they are formed. So it says they adapt to the environmental conditions. Where are mangroves formed? One student shared that she heard about two species. Actually, here it speaks about the red mangrove, the black mangrove, and the white mangrove. How many so far? The red mangrove is, this was not mentioned there, of, but we heard about two, but there are actually eight, about around 80 species of mangroves. Can you take a guess about how many different types we have growing in Belize? Alexander? Five? Okay, let's see how close you, you, you are, okay? Most commonly, they occur within, so you would have the red mangrove along the coast, and farther away, you have the black mangrove. We find them along the coast, and of course, in warm, warmer countries, okay? A special, there are special community of plants and have what is called water log. It's a tropical maritime tree or shrub of the genus, Rhizophora, okay, have special aerial roots and salt filtering top roots that enable them to, to thrive in brackish water. What do, does it mean by brackish water? Brackish water. They survive. They thrive in brackish water. They live in brackish water. What would be brackish water? I'm hearing. Kyle? Rough water. Rough water. Not um not 
Not quite so, but thanks for, for trying. Marcelina, what would be brackish water? Earlier, we described the water as saline, which is salty. So what would be brackish? Fresh along with salty. So you get a mixture of both, right? Mangroves are salt tolerant trees of tropical and subtropical regions where rivers empty into the ocean. And that's typical in Belize. We have the mangroves growing along, along the, um, the rivers and you will see those mangrove trees going right on. And we're in Belize City, right by the Halova there, where the river then will empty into the sea. That's where you, along, all along those banks, you will see the mangrove. All mangroves have a root system that sticks up in the air so the plant can breed. And these are called, let's say together, the roots that stick up in the air, they are the prop roots. They are the prop root structures that extend midway from the lowland, the structures that extend upward from the root into the air. So you have the prop roots and you have what is called the pneumatophores. Right? Prop roots that support the plant. So, specifically, the different mangroves will have their own little area that you would find them, mainly. It says, where would we find the red man mangroves? Specifically, those would be where? On keys and waterways. So, that would be right along the water. So, you would have the red mangrove along the coast. And farther away, you have the black mangrove. From farther away from the water's edge. So you would not, you would not necessarily find the black mangrove on the arm. Um, where the red mangroves are, those would be in a little bit more. And can be recognized by the small protrusions called pneumatophores that encircle the base of the tree on the ground. The white mangrove now and buttonwood species are generated even farther away from the edge of the water. So if you're looking for red mangroves, where would you travel? And if you're looking for the black, where would you go? And if you're looking for the white or the buttonwood, where would you go? Even more, okay, farther away from, from the arm, um, from the course. Mangroves have the ability to filter out salt before they take up water in their tissues. Very well explained by Elston just a while ago. They extrude salt out of their system through special pores on their leaves. Extrude, extrude means that they, they push it out. Mangrove community is valued for its protection and stabilization of low-lying coastal lands. What does that mean? That they are landing blue, like blue areas. Okay. They're valuable to low-lying areas. Give, can anyone in here give an example of a lowing line, a low line area in our Belize, in Belize? What would be a low line area in Belize? Belize City. Belize City. Yes. Okay. It is important in estuarine and coastal fishing food chains. They are also important for the uplands and even for storms, winds, waves, and floods. So you're going to, you can say that mangroves help her, would protect all areas. As long as we value them and we protect them, they definitely will help Belize City and they can help Belmopan. Okay? They provide protected nursery areas for fishes, crustaceans, fishes that you would find in the, in the coral reef, along the coral reef. It provides the nursery for those before when they're very small, and then they move out to go farther. Many animals find shelter either in the roots or branches of mangrove. There's a relation about collection of the sediments in relation to the, to the coral reef. When mangroves 
collect the sediments. In what way is this important to coral reefs? Because if the sediment or different debris get caught up in the in the coral reef, um, it can possibly kill them, possibly kill them on the um, coral reef. If the sediments reach the coral mm -hmm. reef, and we learned that last week that we want um, clean water, isn't that so? Clear, clean water um, that is that um, locks sediments in the in the coral reef. So. The mangroves actually protect the coral reefs too because it collects the sediments and so less will reach the coral reefs. Mangrove trees act as feeding and nursery grounds for approximately 74 species of fish, 178 bird species. They provide habitat for 11 species of amphibians. For us, we need to be protected by the, um, from hurricanes and mangrove is actually very important for our own protection and for our own life, okay? So it protects us and our homes against hurricanes and refuge for many marine organi organisms that are of commercial or sport value. Here, because of the mangroves, we are able to get our food. We are able to get marine products to eat. If we do not have mangroves or we do not protect the mangroves, then we will not have these nurseries that the little, that the, um, the little um, animals, the sea animals can, that they can survive and thrive and then later on move out to deeper waters. Areas where widespread destruction of mangrove has occurred usually experience a decline in fish, in fisheries. So what, when you start chopping down, when we, when we start um, removing them then and dredging, we're going to find that we're going to have less fishes because there'll be less nurseries for the younger ones. There won't be a habitat or a home for them. So they will not survive as well as if the mangrove is there. Our endangered species reside in mangrove forests. I saw a picture where we had this um, the mangrove and there was this jaguar so even the endangered species find themselves um, um, around or between or beside or into the forest of mangroves they find ways and means to protect themselves and to keep themselves alive in those areas mangrove forests are also important in terms of aesthetic and tourism of course when the tourists come to Belize they want they will want to see the mangroves and they and they're beautiful aesthetic they're very beautiful to look at for them to observe for them to study you will find a lot of tourists actually go and visit mangrove and study them like what we saw in the video many people visit these areas even for tourists they are attracted to the mangroves also here is the black mangrove take a look at what we see there this is the black mangrove and we said that they would be found mainly where? Mainly, where would we normally find them? Okay, so here is um, the black mangrove. It is the largest and tallest of the three types listed above because of their age. So black mangrove is actually, the, it says it's the largest and the tallest of the three types. Which types have we spoken about? white and okay black mangrove is a woody shrub that grows in salt marshes they are found upland to the red mangroves located at higher elevations and are the most cold tolerant what do you think it means by they're the most cold tolerant what would that mean go ahead edwin black it means that black mangroves um can survive more than um, the other two in lower in lower temperatures because it is more cold tolerant tolerant to it. To you. Okay. The bark of this tree is dark, which gives it the name black mangrove. So if you're looking for black mangrove, what do you, what can you specifically look for? The dark barks. 
The leaves are shiny, dark green on top, oblong, oblong and pointed at the tip, oblong. Do you know what the game football that is playing in the United States? Okay, do you know that ball that they play with? That's an oblong shape, okay? The sides of the leaves are a dull color with short, dense hairs glands which excrete the salt. So let's, um, let's take a look at specifically what it says here. It says that the top of the, the, top of the leaves are, are half the colors of, half the, the colors, it's dark green, but at the, underneath the leaf you will find a dull green. It say that at the top, it's dark and at the and underside it has a dull green color. Let's remember that, please. The leaves serve as a backup system for ridding the black mangrove of the salt that has been excreted by the roots. So we hear a whole lot of the importance of the leaves of the mangroves, and that's the reason why they survive in the salt water. Here is the red mangrove. Take a guess from what you see here. Why do you think they're called the red mangrove? Because the roots have a reddish color at the bottom. Thank you. Okay. The red mangroves can be distinguished by the reddish color of the bark of the trunk roots. The prop roots of the red mangroves arch out from the trunk and branches, producing additional roots that give the tree an appearance as it is walking in the water. They also call it the walking tree. Let's look at the roots again. Doesn't it look like it's walking? The leaves range from one to two inches, are broad and blunt at the tip, and have a shiny deep green color with a lighter green on the underside of the leaf. Is there some similarity here? What's the similarity? The color of the what was the color of the upper side of the of the um dark green. it was dark green what's the color of this one dark. it's deep green and the other side it it is it is lighter it is dull okay and that filtering system it's about filtering the salt from the tree the red mangrove bears viviparous seedlings this means that the seeds, before they begin to grow, they begin to germinate before it drops off the tree. The single seeded fruit sprout. It grows about 6 to 12 inches and appear as cylindrical pods. But they really are seedlings that consist mostly of a long top root topped by a small bud. These unique seedlings are called propagules. And here is the white mangrove. When you look at the white mangrove and you look at the red mangrove, give me the features on what we see here. The red mangroves have a reddish color root and the white mangrove have a whitish color root. Okay. Do you, let's go back to the red, please. Look at its thickness. Let's look at the white one. Is there a difference? Yes, these are a little slimmer. The roots are a little slimmer. Okay? Can we go to the characteristics, please? The white mangroves are located at higher elevations than both the red and black mangrove. And um, Yadira, if they're at higher elevation, what does that mean? We said that they're from different places. What does that mean for the white mangroves? The, they um they are usually found like um the, when the water is higher or farther uh, away, right? They are farther away. Okay, thank you. This type can also be identified by its leaves. Let's hear about the leaves. The leaves are a light green color, approximately three inches in length, and are rounded at both ends. At the base of the leaves, you will find two bumps called glands. The glands excrete the salt found in the water like a filtering system. Does it say here that one side of the leaf has a bright color? 
Does it say that? No. Okay, it says that the leaves are mainly light green in color. So there's a difference here if you're looking for white mangroves. Okay? See them there? Buttonwood tree. So we have heard, we've heard about tree types. And here we hear about the buttonwood. Let's look at it. The tree is usually found in the higher mangrove elevations. So which other type of mangrove would you find the buttonwood tree around or, or close to? The white. The scientific name of the buttonwood mangrove is Conocarpus erectus because it grows high on land, high on land away from the reach of the tide. But other scientists say this tree still belongs to the mangrove group because it can survive in harsh environments with salty and dry soil. So it is always a discussion if buttonwood is a, man, is a part of the um, mangrove species or it's not. But it has, what we know is that it has some sim similarities of those um, of the red, the white, and the black in that it survives in the same type of um, soil and it survives in salty water. They have dark gray bark and leaves which are either oval, leathery, and smooth green or sharply pointed with salt glands at its base. So it also has its salt glands. Buttons, button wood, have green flowers that mature into a wrong purple fruit. The name buttonwood comes from the button-like appearance of the flower heads that grow in branch clusters forming cone-like fruit. The flowers are greenish in color. Buttonwoods do not reproduce through propagules, but instead producing seed cases. So they, they, um, they reproduce from seed cases. While the tree mangrove species have leaves that occur opposite of each other, the buttonwood leaves alternate. They have a pattern, they have a pattern, um, they have a pattern of, their, of their growth. Now the others, they grow like in a different way from how this one has a specific, specific pattern of how they grow on the tree. Buttonwoods have long pointed leaves that have two salt excreting glands located at its base. That's a similarity with the mangroves, with the other red and the white and the um, black mangroves, okay? Time now for a little bit of your own reflection. I'd like you to take one of the markers and I'd like you to draw one leaf. You draw a leaf that you can write one function of the mangrove, whether that's the black, the red, the white, or the buttonwood. They all have their functions. you have written. Can I have two volunteers to share what they wrote? Go ahead, Kyle. Mangroves are home to many animals, providing them with shelter and food. Thank you very much. Quite so true. Go ahead. Is that Rosalina? They protect uplands from storms, winds, waves, and floods. Very good. A very interesting um, video to watch again.
In the subtropics, most coastal habitat that's left undisturbed, um, a lot of it anyway, where mangroves are able to establish, those will be the dominant vegetation that's there. And a lot of the landforms that are here are here because mangroves managed to establish and hold on to the land that was there. So the keys that you'll find out closer to the Mesoamerican Reef, you'll find a large fringe of mangroves and sand behind it, and, and those mangroves are what essentially keeps that key in place. And land builds up behind it, it's able to trap sediment, add a little bit of organic matter to the land that's there. Um, and so that is, that is the coastline that's here in, in Central America and here in Belize. It's incredibly important to Belize. The reef and mangrove marine system together has been estimated to have an economic value between 350 and 550 million U.S. dollars per year. That's goods and services, primarily tourism, coastal um, development, shoreline protection of the coastal properties, and also um, fishing. So those three services, it's, it's just incredible. On top of that, it provides important habitat for wildlife, for birds, for fish, for invertebrates, and um, those help drive things like fisheries and other sorts of ecosystem services that are here in Belize. So um, well, they're a critical habitat. They've been identified as a critical habitat um, by most of the conservation organizations that are here. Um, the fishers recognize the long-term experience that with the mangroves they get the fish, and they recognize also that you know, the mangroves protect their shoreline and keep it intact for things like hurricanes and tropical storms that come in and threaten you know, the ability of this peninsula to even remain here. Well, there is a, a positive relationship between the presence of mangrove and, and the health of coral close by. I mean, if mangroves are holding down the sediments, they're preventing those sediments from being resuspended in the waves and then settling back on top of the coral. So, so that is an important dynamic there. Um, seagrasses are also very important for that process. As you know, there's a tremendous link, strong link, between healthy mangroves and the health of the reef, um, um, the health of fish populations on the reefs, because so many of the reef fish species actually have their um, juvenile stages in the mangroves. So if we lose the mangroves, we're really affecting the reef that way as well. Mangroves, as far as a land-based habitat, yes, they are, they are probably the most important buffer for that particular dynamic. One of the biggest threats we've been seeing so far to mangroves in Belize has been, I believe, tourism development. You know, uncontrolled coastal development. It's been a lot of resorts, casinos, um, retirement homes, condos, you know. And so that's what we've been seeing as our biggest threats. Uh, just pretty much tourism development has taken over. And um, with that, you can't, you can't seem to find enough shoreline or enough beachfront, and therefore people are creating their own beachfront. And when they try to do this, their only option is to remove what's naturally there, and what's naturally there is the mangrove forest. Globally, there's been quite a bit of mangrove removal associated with shrimp farming. Um, mangrove has been filled in, and the, the ponds have been used to raise shrimp, and the mangroves gradually die out from inside those ponds. But here in Belize, that hasn't occurred. And, and um, there's been minimal, minimal mangrove removal associated with shrimp farming. So in general, Belize has good mangrove laws. Um, most of the major industries have tried to avoid um, impacting them. And, um, and really, I think that far at the top of the list is development and tourism. So, so we, we have a pretty good situation here um, in terms of a lot of the stressors that other countries would see. I think it's a, it's a question of, of values and will at this point. What do you value and do you have the will to retain, uh, retain that or keep that? Um, I think education will be important, but at the end of the day, um, it's, it's a classic trade-off, I think, between short-term and long-term value. And so that's where the balance we're trying to strike of saying, okay, well, let's look at the areas that are better suited to development and only develop those areas and not some of the low-lying um, mangrove areas that are important for fisheries, coastal protection, flood control, that sort of thing. The sales that Adrian's discussing, where, you know, can you get the buck now and sell the piece of land now 
versus what will this property look like in a hundred years after it's been hit by a hurricane a couple of times and, and you know what what will the value of the natural resources offshore be um, what will the value of this place be when the sea levels come up half a meter or a quarter of a meter or something like that I mean that that discussion is is a discussion that's going on all over the world over a range of issues and and we're finding out right now you know who's who's going to win that debate it's going to take a lot of foresight and a lot of um, a lot of wisdom I think to choose the long-range option over the short-range option what are two key factors affecting mangroves particularly in Belize as that we have viewed and listened to just now. Erwin? Development along the coast. Development along the coast. And the other? Elston? Tourism. Tourism. Threats to mangrove. Can someone explain what is seen here? It's the area of mangrove being um, growing. It looks like fishes um, attacking the roots of the mangroves or doing damage to it, probably eating the roots of um, the mangroves. Okay. That fish there, does it look alive? But if we look at the root of the mangrove, what do we see there? Does it look healthy? No, it doesn't. Okay, that's what we need to look at there because that is happening. And these are pictures of Belize. Here again, it's another picture from Belize. What do we see among the mangrove in the water? Garbage. We see garbage. What happens here? Deforestation. Erwin, D? Deforestation. Yes, the dredging. Cutting down of mangroves, okay? Despite the significant importance that mangroves have on the environment, they are currently experiencing a major threat. That threat is clearance. As the demand for coastal settlements and development continues to increase, so does the elimination of this essential habitat. It's not only Ambergris Key, but because that's one of the main tourist places in Belize, we find that there's a lot of development happening on Ambergris Key. And there is a problem whereby too many mangrove trees in different places have to be dredged. They have to be cut down to provide spaces for the development. Sea walls are often put up in an attempt to prevent erosion. But ironically, the opposite occurs. This sets off a chain of events that adversely affect the coastal coast ecosystem and are often irreversible. Once it's affected, it says that it's often irreversible. It's going to take a very, very long time for us to, to get bad things in order. Without a permit granted by the Department of Fisheries, unfortunately, regulations are insufficiently enforced. So that's a problem in Belize also, and that's a threat. Degradations, the degrading of mangroves, are caused by nature-induced changes, for example, tropical storms. So it can happen naturally too. Diseases also call devas cause devastating damages to mangroves. For example, increased soil salinity due to reduced degradation and destruction of mangroves. Groves. Last week we heard about stress on coral reefs will also, you can have stress on the mangroves and eventually they will die. That's naturally. There's an issue that I recorded here and this happened, this actually is a typical problem that occurred in Belize. A particularly ill-sighted development project now under final regulatory review in Belize directly threatens mangroves and significant surrounding ecosystems. Many marine species, particularly reef fishes and certain invertebrates, rely on mangroves and seagrasses for the feeding and protection of their young. Numerous birds and reptile species nest, rest, and feed among mangroves, safe from predators. 
The food chain for this marine life begins in the mangroves with the algae that grow on mangrove roots and the bacteria and fungi that feed on the decomposing mangrove leaves. When the mangroves are destroyed, the effects felt by all the species dependent on them, including bird and fish populations far away from the site of the damage. Now, this was actually a document on Belize where there was an issue of the dredging of mangroves for development. Now, from what was said, the issue related to you, what was the issue? It's a typical one that has occurred or keeps occurring in Belize. It's all about development. But how did they describe this development? Called ill-sighted. What does it mean by ill-sighted development? They only want to do it so they can make money and they don't focus on the environment. Okay. Focus on their own goals, ill-sighted. It also may mean the place where they decide to do the development. What place is this? It's an endangered area. It's in the, it's a part of a mangrove swamp. And that's why it's called incited, ill-sighted development. It's a project where they, they were going to cut down the mangroves for development, a very large area. Now, you the students, I want you in groups right around your table, I'd like a five step action plan. You will take action on what occurs from this typical problem that happens in Belize where we have ill-sighted development, the cutting down and the threats to our mangrove. So kindly identify an action plan or develop an action plan. Five steps. You will take action now. You're going to write your action plans that you would use to protect mangrove systems in your environment. A five-step action plan, I would like to ask them to present that action plan in the next two minutes that we have. Action plan for protecting our mangroves. When you are ready, sir. Okay, um, our action plan, um, step one. We have do research, finding out where, mang where mangroves are being destroyed mostly. And step two, announce importance of mangrove publicly. Um, step three, form a mangrove awareness club or like an environmental club and step four we have do conservative projects that can help cleaning up mangrove and the debris that are placed on it in everyday life and next step five involves government in in providing financial funds thank you give them a clap um, students, it was a long-winded um, PowerPoint. Um, give yourselves a clap for all your input. And, um, the drawings that you did and all that you did, I will be collecting afterwards, okay? Kindly write your names and your group names on your, on your, um, on your paper. Thank you very much.